Uh, so the next session is on open networking and multi-vendor convergence, so standards and interoperability. We've got a great lineup here with, the, oops, sorry, Maurizio Gazzola, head of optical architecture, and, and Andy Schutz, VP of routing products, and Sushin, <laughs> who is director of optical systems, and he's gonna pronounce his last name for you all. So take it away, guys. Thanks, Lisa. So um, over the next uh, 45 minutes, um, <clears throat> Andy, Maritza, and myself will give you a view into the state of open networking and multi-layer convergence. So, to start with, I want to provide the scope of what we'll discuss today for open networking. So we'll talk about open line systems, which simply mean you can connect transponders or code and optics from any vendor to a given line system in a agnostic fashion. We'll talk about open code and interfaces, which refer to line side improperable DWM optics in a MSA package. And um, the, there's a number of uh, MSA groups working on this, and um, Maurizio will talk a lot more uh, on, on the side. The, uh, we'll also talk about host side interoperabilities, which is, which is really important to get to a plug and play model for uh, code and DWM optics. Uh, and last, we'll talk about open management. Now, this is important when you have uh, multi layer, multi vendor, multi domain uh, networks. And um, open config has done a lot of work on device automation. The initial focus was around configuration and telemetry, and now the attention has shifted more towards operations automation, things like um, health checks or certificate management, OTDR. That's, that's what uh, Open Config is working on now. Um, the Open Networking Foundation and the Transport API is what a lot of the, the vendors have um, uh, worked on to get the network level orchestration to work for multi-vendor environments. And we lean heavily on IETF for any, any multi-layer managed and orchestration uh, models. So we'll certainly also talk about the challenges of open management and how Cisco is, is solving them today. So do wanna call out that we are driving a lot of the MSA groups uh, in the OIF, uh, the West CMIS, is really important for host side management, host referring to routers or switches, how they can manage different kinds of code and optics. Uh, there's strong contributions uh, from uh, Stefan on the latest Siemens 5.3 standard. And uh, Gary and, and Doug have always been um, uh, driving Siemens to uh, managing optics in a, in a neutral way and, and the app cell approach, which we'll discuss more today, how that's gonna really help simplify the management of any DC optics on uh, routers and switches. Uh, Mike Slusky, he's, he's made some significant contributions on the specs for 400ZR as well as for OpenZR Plus. Uh, Tom Williams is the co-chair for the OpenZR Plus MSA. And the LPU MSA, which was uh, recently formed at, uh, at OFC, uh, Mark Noel is chairing that group. And we also participate in a number of uh, groups and activities in IEEE and IETF. So uh, before you move on, let's talk about why open networking is important to operators. So let's discuss the benefits and also some of the concerns that we, we hear from, uh, from different operators. So the first obvious one is to reduce dependency on vendors. So you wanna reduce dependency on the financial health or the investment decisions and roadmap of uh, the, the suppliers or vendors you're working with, you know, the state of quality of their products, supply chain, reduce the dependency uh, on what they're doing for your business outcomes, which could be, you know, things like, you know, you want to move fast, you want better lead times, uh, you have resiliency and availability expectations uh, or cost profiles you want to hit over the next few years. So being able to achieve that without uh, excessive dependence on one, one vendor. Uh, with a healthy ecosystem of supplies, of course, your costs improve, your ROI is much better. Uh, one concern that we often see is the OPEX implication of uh, onboarding and, and maintaining multiple suppliers. 
Uh, and so there is qualification work, interop work that you need to take on for multiple vendors, and also the integration into management and automation for multiple, uh, multiple vendors. So we'll talk about how Cisco is helping to simplify the host side and network management of having multiple vendors and multiple layers in the network. Uh, there is, even with the simplification, going to be some overhead of having multiple vendors. And uh, what we think is uh, the, the, the right approach is to think about what the overhead is of having multiple vendors in the network and right size that to, to, uh, to make sure that's offset by the value that you can have by having the different vendors in your network. So uh, vendor diversity also certainly helps with um, agility. You can you know, customize the network for different applications, different topologies, just move fast. The, um, the other side to that question is how do you troubleshoot when you have problems? How do you uh, solve those issues in the network? And um, we'll, we'll certainly talk about tools. There's a number of interesting uh, options we have for how we can allow you to troubleshoot multi-layer, multi-vendor networks. We'll, we'll discuss that over the next two days, and also we'll show you demos of how that works over the next couple of days. Innovation, uh, with, with an open network, you can uh, adopt new technologies uh, quickly. The, um, the downside of this is, um, uh, or at least a common question that we get from operators is, uh, can a custom closed solution give me a little more performance, uh, more efficiency than an open approach? And uh, this is something we'll debunk further today. There are some marginal improvements to performance that you can get with a custom solution. But when you look at the overall TCO with an open standards-based approach, the, the, uh, the TCO and the ROI is going to be way better for an open approach. Uh, and last, open standards allow for seamless interoperability in the network. And this is, of course, a huge benefit to, uh, an, uh, to, to an open network. The um, uh, a question that we often see is how ready are the standards for any op for any to any interoperability, and we'll also discuss that today. So, with that, uh, the first topic we had open line systems. I'm going to talk about that, and then I'll hand off to to Maritza and, and Andy to talk about the the others. So, state of open line systems. Now, we have seen broad adoption of open line systems over the last few years uh, from web and telco service provider customers. Uh, what, what's driving this? Uh, the first one is uh, flex spectrum modems have made it a whole lot easier to have different generations uh, of coherent technology, different uh, kinds of coherent um, options riding on the same transport network. Also, the adoption of coherent optics in a, uh, that's just ramped up over the last few years, and that inherently has caused a disaggregation of the coherent technology from the line system. A third key driver is that the life cycle of the line system is fundamentally, is fundamentally very different from that of the, the core and optics. Uh, there's a new generation of core and technology coming out every two to three years, and so that's much, much faster than what, what you see for a line system, which could be uh, in operation for anywhere from five to 10 years. Now, I do want to call out that when we talk about disaggregation of the, the line system, Full disaggregation of the line system as uh, specified and advocated by Open Rodim, where you have different amplifiers from different vendors or different rodims from different vendors interoperating in the same network. We've not seen any real traction on that. And also the business value, the economic value of doing that is not really clear. So how are open line systems evolving? So some key problems to think about is um, one, with uh, the coherent optics now being mainstream the, um, and disaggregated from, the, from the, the, the line system, the turn up of the line system in, in a lot of cases happens day one and ahead of when the coherent optics are turned up on the switcher router. So you need mechanisms to make sure that you can validate the end-to-end the, the, the -end signal flow on the line system day one before you have any coherent optics or coherent source available. The second key thing that we see is that the coherent optics and the line system are not co-located in many cases. The coherent optics could be in a switch or a router in different buildings spread across a campus and then connect into a line system that's located somewhere else. So this, in turn, can cause different losses from where the coherent optics is, is located into the line system. And so you need a way to offset this difference in performance. 
The last is, you know, you have Corin Optics. Uh, there's some differences in performance that we also see from different vendors. There's also different generations of Corin Optics you need to account for in, in a given line system. So how do you compensate for some of these? The first one is you need to make sure that there is an equalization or a pre-emphasis element built into the optical terminal. Now, this, how this helps, uh, one is that you can, for any differences in performance of the optics or different generations of Corin optics, or even the difference in losses from optics sitting in different buildings going into the, into the line system, you can compensate, mitigate the, the optical uh, effects of that. The second is that because you need some way to validate the line system day one, uh, a Corin probe and or noise loading become really useful to do that day one before you have any Corin optic available uh, for, for turn up. Connection verification is something else that's very useful. Uh, you can use uh, uh, low speed tones to signal between the, the Corin optic and the, the add drop structure of the line system to validate that the fiber patching is set up correctly. And last, an inbuilt optical channel monitor that gives you a view into the power distribution across the, the spectrum that's used in and out of uh, the, the card or you know, what's coming out of the, the fiber that's really useful to understand what's the characteristics of the third party core and optic or core and source that's coming in. You know, what, what's the shape of the signal, you know, what frequency it's being used, now it's being spaced relative to noise or other channels. So all that is way more visible to the operator with, with, with an inbuilt optical channel monitor. So the last thing I want to leave you with on the open line system front is some of the concerns that we, we see. So one of the concerns that we come across is that the commercial model of an open line system is quite different from when you buy the core and optics and the transponder with the line system. Now, this is a fact. The, the, the open line system will be uh, at, uh, it's gonna be more expensive day one, but it's important to note that over the, the life of the network, when you include the core and optics and the line system, the TCO is gonna be significantly better when you have an open line system approach. Now for operators that still really care about day one costs and it's, it's really important that that's, that's low, we have bundles and license options that uh, we, we, you can take advantage of that allows you to get the day one costs lower. Third-party transponders, and how do you plan and model that on an OLS? Uh, now, planning tools today, most of them, including uh, the Cisco planning tool, which, we, uh, which is the Cisco Optical Network Planner, or CONP, have alien wave modeling capabilities. So you need to know some uh, specific characteristics of the, the alien signal. Uh, you can code uh, or configure that uh, into this alien wave in the, in the planning tool and then simulate that on the line system. So this is something that we can manage today. And the last one is how do you troubleshoot for link flaps or errors? Now, uh, as I mentioned before, we have a number of tools and uh, the hierarchical control orchestrator or HCO is one of them that allows you to correlate faults and stats across vendors and across layers. And we'll talk about this more the next two days and also you'll see this in action over the next two days. All right, so with that, uh, over to Maurizio to talk about Corinoptics. Thanks, Sushin. So, uh, Sushin introduced the concept of opt optical line system open networking. What uh, uh, I will go deeper will be um, how the digital coherent optics can be used in this kind of environment. First of all, we need to just shape the field. So one, we are speaking about a multi-vendor environment that at the end is one of the key goal of an open line system. So accepting pluggable from different vendors and also having a different routing system hosting different pluggable. There are multiple variants. We can see here that we could speak about one WDM, one OLS system with pluggable and router, but the WDM system can belong to one vendor. The router can be on different vendors. We can have a uh, pluggable of one vendor on one side and pluggable of the same vendor of the router on the other side. 
but we can also have same routing on the other side, but with the pluggable that belong to a different vendor from the routing side. And we have the wonderful mix and match with a router vendor, an OLS vendor, pluggable from different, another vendor on a different router. So that is the so famous concept of any plug in any host. So I want to plug everything. I want the complete freedom to do whatever I want. That is the vision. Let's go a little bit on details on what is needed to allow this. There are many different aspects. We are speaking about first basic, the WM network uh, compatibility. So what we need from our coherent DCO to interwork correctly with the OLS. Then there is a very important aspect that is the performance. How, what is the reach? What are the bit rates that I can support with that pluggable? Then major, major aspect is that the router and the switch compatibility of the DCO. That is, again, a, a key part that Andy will go much more in details than me is that what does it mean having any host, any pluggable in any possible router? And finally, not less important will be what are the management and the automation hurdle when we are speaking about coherent on a, a router and what is the right management model? So those are the four pillars and let's proceed with that. First one, WDM network compatibility. This is between bracket, very easy. For, for everything is very clear in the industry. You can have both ROIDM or a classic Max DMAX. What are the requirements? I can have both a fixed grid or a flex grid on, or on the terminals on the ROIDM. There is no problem on that. The, the only thing I need to care initially is the supported minimum grid. When I speak about a 400 gigabit DCO, bare minimum, I need to have a 75 gigahertz. It is a 60 gigabit time, type of channel. So ballpark 60 gigahertz, I need a nice 75 gigahertz filter. This is for 400 gigabit. Now we are speaking about 800 gigabit, you will see the minimum will be 150. Anush mentioned 1.6 terabit, you can imagine 300 gigahertz. So those are, what is commonly expected from the system. If you have a 50 gigahertz, that's a problem for the higher bit rate. You, it can also work a classical coherent on a 50 gigahertz, but you need to scale down the baud rate in order to fit with the 50 gigahertz window. Finally, the very important element is the input power. You know that we have 400 gigabit ZR and ZR plus that are defined by the standard, they come out with minus 10, minus eight, minus 12, depending on the different variants of the X power. And not all the other drop structure of the various WDM OLS system support that level of input power. So that is a parameter. Of course, now uh, we are shipping uh, the new variant that is the bright ZR plus that is coming direct with the plus one DBM and that's not a problem. But in field, there are a lot of requests of ZR that is minus 10 DBM and this need to be taken account. But again, is, I don't consider anymore that a problem because now we have, a, the industry have fully understood that and I don't really see many problem in field with this kind of interface. Performances, that is where there are some difference in field because we have now many different interface. I have a 400 gigabit ZR, I have the ZR plus, the bright ZR plus, the 400 gigabit ULH that you will see the demo uh, tomorrow, like Lorenzo, I am advertising that, please go to see the demo of the 400 gigabit ULH pluggable, and we have the 800 gigabit ZR plus, again, a good the demo. Now, with that, what is the major advantage, and also as Anuj mentioned in the previous slide, he, he mentioned that more than 70% of the deployment of coherent is going on third party system. And it is another beauty. The fact that I don't need to 
take out the existing WM system, I can also having a system that already populated with some wavelength, I can simply add new wavelength on an existing WM system. And we have a proven experience on the fact that we can have multiple uh, cases of them. This is one that we usually show. It is a France operator, uh, CPARTEC, where it is a mix of SMS28 and ELIF, so neither a classic system. It is have eight RODM in the system. We were able to run an Appian wavelength from Paris, go to Grenoble, go to Clermont Ferrand, and back to Paris in more than 1300 kilometers on a real existing system. It's not a lab environment. There are already wavelength carrying traffic, pay, uh, pay traffic or on, on that system. We simply added the bright uh, ZR plus and it was smoothly without any change on the WDM system. Another key aspect will be the router impact, but I let Andy discussing about it. Thank you. Uh, so I appreciate you letting me sneak in here and give the perspective of the, the router side of the house um, and supporting any optics um, in the context of interoperability. Thank you. Um, and sharing the stage with these guys. Um, so I'm going to give you that perspective and really boil it down to um, really four basic building blocks. Um, if you think about uh, what we need to do from a router or host perspective as it relates to any pluggable or DCL that we're putting on the, on the platform. So first of all, the form factor has to be standardized. Um, I think we're all well aware of that. Um, we're listing QSFP DD here, and we've set, certainly spent a bunch of time on our routing systems um, standardizing around QSFP DD. Uh, second, you know, the actual software that operates this, we need not only to recognize that DCO um, and configure it appropriately, but we also have to have features that work on top of that. And there's work that needs to be done there, of course. Um, the way that we typically do our software on this is we try to abstract from the actual optic, but of course there are certain things that'll be specific to a, a particular port that we have to do additional work. Um, then there's the kind of, <laughs> this is a slippery slope around power and thermals. Um, on how far and how many permutations you want to entertain it as it relates to mixing and matching different optics, the power budgets that they require, the thermal characteristics that they're going to play out on the actual routing system. Um, these things ultimately determine how many we can actually support on a particular system, where they can actually be placed within the system, where they can mix and match within the system. So I think Mauricio was talking about it. I don't know if he's here, but... Um, we typically, when we define a routing system, we put a power budget on a particular port, and then we put that in the context of how many ports we're populating with that particular power budget um, and thermal uh, characteristics around that. So these things kind of collectively make up the work that when someone comes to us on a routing platform and says, hey, we need to support a particular optic on this routing platform, this is typically the work that we have to go through to make sure that we're supporting it properly and you guys can deploy it. Um, with confidence. So um, if you take a step back and think about like what are the questions in the problem space that we're, we're thinking about, there's really basically two areas. Um, you know, one, the life cycle management of the DCO optic itself um, and how that actually operates in terms of provisioning and management um, and configuration. Um, and then finally, the interchangeable, the seamlessly interchangeable things. So you can have a Cisco or a Kashuk optic, you know, sitting next to, you know, another vendor's optic in the same system. Um, and how do you manage that from a network management standpoint? And sometimes these things get mixed together in this conversation and tried to be solved all at once. But I think we're going to kind of break this down. Uh, I'll hand the back, mic back in a second here to Mauricio, but um, to talk about the network management side of the house. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about the the host and the router switch aspect of things. Um, we've covered the standards, I think, a little bit. Uh, obviously, OAF is uh, leading the charge here, and we play a leading role here. Um, so 400 gig in, in its first instantiation on ZR around a metro-type deployment that's been standardized. We Those operate in our systems today. Um, we've extended to ZR Plus uh, for 400 gig and you know extending the reach and things that go with that. Um, and then the CMIS side of things, which is, um, you know, it's been iterating in terms of revisions over time. I think today we currently support 
5.0, but this is um, really dictates how we program that DCO and the mode that that DCO operates within. Um, part of that, and I think uh, Sushin mentioned app cells specifically, part of that is the app cell side of things where you actually indicate through the code, the host code to, um, through the CMIS side of things, what the DCO actually should be configured at from a, a mode perspective. Um, that's largely been abstracted uh, from um, from what you know, you as an operator can see. You're typically exposed to a proprietary CLI like ours or some other vendors that says this is how you know our own interpretation of how that DCO module should be configured, which leads to some you know complications on how you get a Cisco router to talk with another router with different DCOs, and are these actually in the same mode? That sometimes can be hard to you know figure out in the current implementations. Um, thinking a little bit further on these standards, and I'll come back to AppCell in a second here, um, this is kind of a characterization of where the standards are going um, as it relates to the different um, DCOs that are coming out. Obviously, I talked about the 400 gig side, but if you look at 800 gig with open Rotom standards that are coming out, we're participating heavily and plan to support that all under the context of interoperability and seamlessly interchanging optics between systems. And then the same should follow suit as we progress into 1.6 um, in the future here. So uh, we're certainly you know, doubling down there and making sure that we're ready to go from that perspective as well. But that's all under the context of interoperability and seamlessly taking these between systems. Um, so coming back to our problem statement and what I was talking about with AppCell, with the progression into 5.0, we have the ability to now indicate which particular app, uh, app cell and ultimately the mode that we're configuring a particular DCO in directly in the CLI. Um, you can, you'll get a numerical indicator of what that actual mode is and you can figure that on a particular port, giving you a little bit more predictability on one side versus the other side, making sure that we're um, in the same mode. And then as we progress into 5.3, which we have targeted for first half of next year, then you'll have the ability to actually see the descriptors and actually know exactly what's going on, just removing all these levels of and layers of abstraction and really making it very evident for anybody who's putting in these DCOs exactly how they're being configured, what the mode is, and you'll have transparency as it relates to that. Um, now, we'll say this, this doesn't solve the Every time we get a new optic, we have to make sure that we understand, you know, what temperature are we operating in? What's the thermal budget? What is the optical, you know, the optic demand and go through that layer of testing and qualification that will always have to be there at some level. Um, but, you know, predictability is definitely increasing and in allowing this vision, as Mauricio said, in terms of any, any plug, any port actually coming um, a reality for us as, as it relates to the host systems. Thanks, Andy. So the, this is the last aspect, not the less important, because uh, there is the, uh, the, the question is that, okay, I have my pluggable that is replacing a transponder, but the transponder, you know, it's very easy. It is part of the WM system. It belongs to the transport team. They are used to manage it from more than 20 years now. Now I'm taking the pluggable and moving out from the transport to domain and put in a router. Who will manage the pluggable? There are, there are uh, customers that has one single IP and optical team. They don't care, are only the same people. There are teams that are split. There are a transport team, and by the way, also there is operational team and planning team that are different. In some cases, I have the common operational team for IP and optical. I have separate operational team. The planning team could be the same, could be different. So that is an aspect that uh, is pretty important for many customers. On that, so that is the typical challenge. So I have my OLS system with the RADM. It is, we're speaking about, honestly, the full industry is moving to the as the uncompted, so with the domain controller for the technology, so I have my optical controller managing the WDM, 
I have the, my usual IP controller on the routing domain and I have these nice ZR coherent optics plugged in the router. The IP, maybe the IP uh, person is not really up to speed with the 16 QAMO modulation, a probabilistic constellation shaping, uh, the FEC used on the ZR. How can this person manage the ZR optics? Now, let's make it more complex. You know, if I have a WDM vendor and the router vendor being the same, everything is on the same house, a solution could be much easier. But no, as we saw before, 70% of the cases I have a WDM vendor, or also more, because generally we saw cases where the network we have from the Metro one WDM vendor, for the core one or two other WDM vendor, and so also for the routing. And so now the problem is scaling up to understand what is the best way to manage it. The standard, there was a lot of work on the standards because that is a key problem for the industry. The, the message is clear. I want one single management solution that taking care of all the use cases because they are too many. There are one option. One option is that where the ZR is, fit, is placed, it is in the router. Who will manage the router? The IP controller. And the optical controller continue to manage the OLS system, the WDM as it is. There is another option that is saying that, mm, no, I want to maintain the control of the ZR optics because it's a WDM interface. I am the optical uh, controller. Let's directly put an open config interconnection to the router. There are also other fancy way that their proposal to use uh, a sort of uh, tunnel tunnelized VLAN to remote manage the pluggable. And so that those are ballpark high level, there are variants, etc. but high level, those are the two proposals that uh, in the standard. I anticipate that the standard didn't reach a consensus. So there is not one IETF that say that this is the model period because uh, there was a lot of discussion. But I can provide what is the Cisco proposal. Cisco's proposal is going to the, simple, the simplest way. This will provide a very clean and elegant solution from the architectural point of view. We have a, an optical controller for the OLS domain. The IP controller, in our case, the CNC controller for the router domain. The pluggable is managed by the, the, the IP controller simply because the pluggable reside in the router. But this doesn't mean that the IP controller decide which wavelength uh, to be used, which is the, um, the modulation scheme to be used. These decisions are taken by the optical controller because the optical controller needs to know, oh, I need from A to B, I, need, I know that I need 500 gigabit of modulation scheme to reach that distances. So I simply use a hierarchical approach and we have the HCO, the crosswork HCO, exactly built for that to stitch the IP domain and the optical domain with one single uh, view in, in terms of automation functionality. And it will pass the information to the IP, oh, by the way, IP controller, don't care what, you, what is inside my messaging, but it tells the pluggable to go to 500 gigabit modulation scheme with the data FEC. So the intelligence in terms of opti op optical is maintained by the OLS because that is what is needed. But I will not break the fact that everything that is, man is installed in the router is managed by an IP controller. Because what are the problem of this one? The problem are many. The problem is that, first of all, I need to have a mixed DCN. Generally, the vast majority of the customer is that I have the DCN for the IP, 
completely separate, different firewall, different ACL from the optical DCN. They have completely different requirements usually. And so that mixing these, this in that I, I need to have a DCN also with the security problem with that. Second aspect is having two head for one body is usually really, really bad. Okay, take, a, take an example. The optical controller, if it is managing the, the ZR, this is side. Okay, now the distance is uh, too much. I have a problem. Let's put from 400 gigabit to 200 gigabit. You can imagine the router that in, without nobody notifying it has a 50% of bandwidth cut without knowing why, without a notification. That is a major hit, a major harder to the IP traffic engineer. So this is why usually uh, we strongly suggest keep it the cleanest way. We will not break any intelligence, but we will maintain a nice and separate environment from the controller point of view that will allow to cover all the possible use cases. Also worse is the case that this is not to DCN, but it is to an external VLAN that is managed by an external entity, completely tunneling everything in terms of security and control. That is a, another level of complexity that is thrown to the operator and will strongly against this kind of uh, proposal. So our solution is summarizing, but then Rana in the next uh, session will go much more deeper on the architecture is a really Focus on the simplicity, an optical controller for the optical domain, the CNC IP controller for the routing domain, and the crosswork HCO, and I stress in the point, uh, the crosswork HCO has a full multi-vendor capability, so I can have a, a IP controller for different vendor, and it is fully managed with the end-to-end -end view without any problem, allowing so a multi-domain and a multi-vendor uh, configuration and management of the solution. And that's it from uh, the four pillar for uh, the supervision. And uh, um, the key takeaway is, as Sushin mentioned, the open networking, so the capability to have a complete disaggregation of the network, uh, we saw that is now common in any RFP, RFI from uh, most of the customer that we have. So that is a common requirement. This because the adoption of a separate wavelength generation respect to LS give it a lot of flexibility, a, a lot of capability to uh, differentiate the life cycle between OLS and wavelength generation. And this is mainly reducing the cost and uh, uh, improving the network performance because I can always select, uh, you know, that vendor has the best uh, WDM interface. Let's use it. Why I need to wait for my OLS vendor to provide me that. 